Today we've got a great story of getting somebody banned from a store. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, my college instructor I was a TA for threatened to write a bad TA evaluation. I turned a class lecture against him. So let's go back to the pre-COVID days of college. I was in graduate school and started my first semester as a teaching assistant for a theories class. Now the major associated with this class is more art or creative oriented. They're the type of student base that couldn't care less about theories or other academic discourse. So traditionally, our department usually had very engaging instructors to help make the required class more palatable. Or at the very least, the class was easy enough to avoid being a weed out class. Enter Mr. A. The short of it is that Mr. A was a PhD student who had a dislike for our undergrads. I understood that graduate and doctorate students treat undergrads like opportunistic raccoons, usually for good reason, but Mr. A took it to another level. He was outright antagonistic to a hostility I've never seen from an instructor. The first conversation I had with the guy involved him sitting me down. The first thing you should know is to never trust these students. You do not want to be their friends, he said. Now, I recognize the sentiment, but the tone was on the level of a character from a zombie apocalypse movie. The level of contempt in his voice was discomforting. Cut to the first day of class. Mr. A had two instructions for me that I had to follow throughout the semester, and both reflect his sentiment towards his students. First, he wanted everyone assigned to seats in alphabetical order for a class of over a hundred students. So on the first day, we had to spend the first 30 minutes naming every person on the roster to get them seated. And then he expected me to take attendance every class, putting the names to the alphabetical order we sat the students in. He gave me no ID pictures and simply expected me to just learn all the names. Now, it didn't occur to us to just map a seating chart, but in my defense, I was TA for less than a week at this point and was relying on the wisdom of Mr. A early on. I also have anxiety disorder, so my panicked bud wasn't going to think up a quick solution. I still wonder why Mr. A, who has taught for a number of semesters at this point, didn't provide me with that idea, since it seems so obvious in retrospect. The second thing he wanted me to do was monitor the class in the back to make sure students weren't using their phones, and give them a zero on their participation grade if they were. So I had to know which students were not participating without a seating chart or not immediately knowing their name. This showcased his deep lack of trust in his students. He wanted little room for the students to cheat the system, which is hard to do with 120 odd students and a TA with no experience. Suffice it to say, it was a crap show. My accuracy was horrible and sitting through every class to monitor was terrible. Remember when I said that the theories instructor was usually engaging to make the clinical material more tolerable? Yeah, Mr. A wasn't that. To put it simply, if I had him as a teacher when I was an undergrad, I would have considered him the worst instructor I ever had. He was vague, didn't compel discussion, and generally felt more like an obstacle to the student's learning than a guide. He was so bad that when another PhD student subbed for him and actually taught the class, you can feel the atmosphere of the room change. You would have never have thought a Nigerian man could take a theories lesson and turn it into a paradise, but it sure felt like that to the students and I. So about a few weeks in, and I threw my hands up and just did the old sign-up sheet method. This lasted for most of the semester, until the last month where Mr. A sent a critical email telling me to revert back to the old method. When I told him my concerns, as well-mannered as I could, he accused me of being hostile and other inflaming adjectives. I suppose he wanted to seem I was the agitator for email evidence. He also threatened my TA evaluation, which I did not take well, which leads to the main event. Part of the class was an essay, and in the fine print of the assignment laid one sentence. This assignment can be worked with another person. The vagueness and lack of limitations could easily cause confusion, even be exploited in the right hands. When I showed him my concern for this part of the assignment, he waved it off and said this wouldn't be a problem. This sort of put me over the edge. I'm not quick to anger, but that was close to what pulling the final straw felt like. Cut to class and he's explaining the assignment. I know the moment a student asks about the group project line, it would easily cause a ruckus, but no one was saying anything. So I took matters into my own hands. I got the attention of a student sitting next to me. Hey, look to page three, I whispered. 
He turned to the page in question right before I stabbed this paper with my finger. Can you ask Mr. A about this line? Naturally, he was confused. I mean, why the heck would the TA be asking him to do such an odd thing? But I reassured him and told him to humor me. A few minutes later, he raised his hand and asked the question. What followed was the most insane, chaotic, and out-of-control college class I've seen. It was like a high school auditorium. People were talking over each other and asking questions. Girls were already deciding who to work with. People were just on their phones and couldn't care less. This was an over-hour-long class, and about 50 minutes of it was dedicated to clearing up the confusion to this one freaking line. This assignment can be worked with another person. Mr. A looked overwhelmed as he tried to rein control of his class while I stared at him like Griffith from Berserk. It was my most satisfying moment as a TA. There's more to the story, but I'll stop here since that's where the pettiness ends. As I've matured, I look back and wish I'd done things differently. I realize now that I made mistakes and learned lessons during that time. I totally understand if this story rubs you the wrong way. I sometimes feel the same way. That being said, while I don't remember the names of any of my 120 odd students, I still remember Mr. A's face trying to tame them. It's kind of like you're at a dog kennel and everybody has to have the muzzle on, and all of a sudden one gets the muzzle loose and barks, and all of a sudden everybody's muzzle falls off and it's just pandemonium. It sure is nice to give those 120 students a sense of freedom in their college experience, right? Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of revenge, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our next story is Simple Anatomy Lesson for a Teacher. English is not my first, per se, but since my mom used to live in the US, I learned English as well as German. Learning a language like that tends to make you fluent, but gives you a serious disadvantage when it comes to grammar, and tends to make you really unpopular with teachers. That or the fact that I was a big mouthed little crap, no idea which one it was. My English teacher in high school was an incredibly stuck up witch, with a stick made of mithril up her butt. As you can imagine, we didn't get along well. My comments earned me a lot of extra homework along the year, so I decided to have a little fun of my own. I wrote the word penis on the blackboard, not too big on the lower left corner. As soon as she saw the dirty word, she turned red, grabbed the sponge and rubbed the little devil's root out of existence. Next lesson, it was back. A little larger, a little more in the middle, again she rubbed it away. This went on for nearly two weeks incrementally bigger and bolder until the word took up the whole blackboard. Any attempt to find the culprit were met with silence. At the last day, I wrote it as large as the blackboard would allow. Below, I wrote, the more you rub it, the bigger it gets. I gotta say, OP was a little bit of a jerk, but they'd certainly got bigger over time too. Our next story is, spoiled brat gets bit on the butt. I was working for a small logging business. The owner's son was in charge of everything. He was a very careless kid with no restraint. He knew his dad and mom would bail him out or fix what he damaged. I drove a new car to work one day because I was going to my sister's after work. It was the opposite way from our commute. A flatbed truck was coming to our site to pick up a piece of equipment but couldn't find the site. Boss Jr. wanted to use my car to chase down the truck. I told him no. He had a very bad habit of wrecking all the vehicles. So on Monday, I showed up for work, but was fired on the spot for leaving early Friday. I didn't leave early, but this was his story. So the revenge came a few years later. I was at a bar one night, live music, dancing, packed place. My sister was the bartender. She approached the table and asked if I knew this guy over by the wall. He had no ID. It was Boss Jr. He had a date with him and had driven 40 miles to come to this particular bar. I told my sister I didn't know him and couldn't vouch for him in any way. She kicked him out along with his girlfriend. Revenge is sweet. The nerve to just totally screw somebody over in the past and then later down the road you like mildly know each other still? So you expect them to just vouch for you? I'll vouch for my boot to your face. This next story is refuse my refund? See you in court. Backstory. In June 2021, my wife and Stacy, her friend, took a girl's trip to a certain beach town in the southern part of the USA. They were trying to keep costs low, so they rented a car instead of flying and booked a four-night stay at Scum Inn, a scummy hotel, on Booking.com, which required our payment method. 
Once they got there, in order to check in, they had to sign multiple documents, provide their license plate, provide their driver's license, as well as pay a $100 damage deposit and provide our credit card info again. I guess booking doesn't send over the credit card info for this property? They did all that and went to their room. Upon entering, they didn't like the condition of the room. Hair all over the blankets, rust and mold on the fixtures, crayon on the walls, etc. It was really bad. The original price of the stay was $378.60 but per the hotel's cancellation policy, we had to pay the first night's stay due to canceling within two days, so our refund amount would have been $283.95. They canceled their stay with Booking.com and went to the front desk to confirm the cancellation. The guy at the front desk stated that Booking.com would issue them their refund, but we paid on property? Then shooed them out and locked the door since the office is closed. At this point, it's well past 9 p.m., and wife and Stacy are in an unfamiliar town that they just drove 12 hours to get to with no place to sleep. I was able to book them last minute at Pleasant Place at 9.25 p.m., which they stayed at for the remainder of their stay. It was over $200-ish more expensive, but worth it. All in all, I had spent $863.85 in hotel accommodations just needed the refund for the previous hotel. Now for the revenge part. The revenge. Even though the transactions were still pending on my credit card, I went ahead and disputed them anyway. I provided Soldman Gax the original email and picture I took of the cancellation screen, as well as the cancellation policy that the hotel provides on booking.com. Around three months later, I get a notification that the dispute was not resolved in my favor due to having no evidence. That's odd, I know I submitted it. Okay, I'll dispute it again. This time, after I submitted my evidence, I called them to confirm they received it, which they did. Another three months later, they notified me that the dispute was not resolved in my favor, but this time because Scum Inn had ample evidence that we did, in fact, stay there. Okay, it's game time now. I filed a third dispute, submitted even more evidence, and called them and explained the situation. That Scum Inn is providing documentation that we willingly provided prior to cancellation and that they need to request more documentation before issuing a judgment. Unfortunately, this didn't happen and they still ruled this third dispute in Scum Inn's favor due to them providing the same evidence a second time. I tried once more to submit one more dispute with all the evidence I could gather and called Soldman Gax multiple times to ensure they were following through. In the end, they still refused to issue a favorable judgment. Next, I tried calling Booking.com to see if they can assist with a refund. They told me that since the cancellation policy on the website shows that I was allowed a refund, they would handle getting it to me and would go after the hotel themselves. However, each time I called back, I got a different story until I karened up and asked to speak to a supervisor. The first time I'd ever done that in my life, who in no specific words told me I'm up craps creek without a paddle and there was nothing booking.com could or would do. However, the only shred of good news was that I learned that hotels on their site are responsible for listing their cancellation policies. So whatever a hotel lists is binding at the time of booking. Armed with my pettiest freak attitude and the knowledge booking.com gave me, I set out to file a small claim suit. Reader, don't be fooled, small claims are not as easy as they claim to be. Certain states bury information or require so much that you have to dedicate time just to gather it all. Nonetheless, I managed to scrounge up all the documentation needed and filed my suit in May 2022. It was officially go time. I gathered everything, screenshots of Scum Inn's cancellation policy, all the photos that wife and Stacy took I could use as evidence videos, receipts, credit card statements, screenshots of texts and emails. I was even able to call Pleasant Place and get a copy of my invoice from them. It had been well over a year at this point. All that alone totaled 28 megabytes of data, which I know isn't a lot, but remember, it was just PDFs and screenshots. The largest file being a screenshot that was 2.5 megabytes. Most files were less than 900 kilobytes. 
Being that I live 10 to 12 hours away from the court, based on traffic, I was able to upload all of my evidence to the court case files and they agreed to swear me in via phone. About an hour ago, from the time I'm typing this, the court called me. I was sworn in and then explained everything. The cancellation, the conditions and treatment at Scum Inn, the credit card disputes, and how I wasn't requesting a full refund, just the portion that we are owed. We had to pay that cancellation fee after all. It felt like a weight was finally lifted off my shoulders. Someone is finally listening to me who can actually do something. Then it came time for Scum Inn to tell their side. They claimed they had no documentation we actually checked out because they don't have the paperwork, so they can't prove anything other than what's on paper. That was literally all they had to say. How did Soldman Gax not just side-eye that? The judge then asked both of us a series of questions, including how much the stay per night was, who was the person working the front desk, do I have any other evidence to enter besides what I've already submitted, etc. After everything was said and done, the judge sided with us. During this process, the guy representing Scum Inn decided it would be smart to try and tell the judge that Soldman Gax already denied our dispute four times, to which the judge replied, the credit card company is in the court, I am. I don't care what the credit card company said, it's clear they didn't stay at your hotel. Nice ones, Scum Inn, add fuel to the flames. Because this is a small claims court, there are extra fees that have to be paid by the defendant including the fee to serve court documents and the fee to file the petition to sue. Because I won, I'm owed all that back plus post-judgment interest. So now, I'm just waiting for Scum Inn to pay me my $283.95 plus $129 in court fees plus 7.5% post-judgment interest for a grand total of $413.07. They likely won't pay and I'll have to file a judgment, but at least that gives me more petty revenge to add to the story. Hopefully you enjoyed the read. I know it's not as good as others, but I've been waiting for the day I could finally post this. For all the people that get screwed over by scummy companies like this, let alone a hotel, or something that honestly is on the level of more like a motel, I think just about anybody can appreciate this story. Honestly, this place sounded so scummy, OP probably should have just straight up named them. It's not defamation if you just talk about your experience there and that it was so bad you had to sue them. They already said themselves they don't even have documentation that you were even there. Are they really going to take you to court again? Our next story is my sister-in-law. My sister-in-law, after a 15-year marriage, ended up with all of our belongings. My husband had died and I was in Mexico with our two children. I was trying to get back home before our rent was due to keep our house. We were between selling our 40 acre ranch and buying a new place. Anyway, I knew if I didn't get back and pay that it would be bad. So our car breaks down in Navajo, Mexico. My kids and I stay there for three days until I can get a bus home. Too late. On the exact date I was supposed to be there, my mother and sister-in-law go to my house and take everything. I was keeping my mother's cherished possessions for her. A lot of boxes, a rocking chair, etc. My sister-in-law tells my mother that she'll keep those things in her barn until she can come get it all. So, end result, my sister-in-law rips my mom off of her possessions and gets everything we've owned. Since we had our own business, there were many things worth money. My sister-in-law will not even give my kids, her niece and nephew, their clothes and toys. She sells everything and starts her own business selling pet supplies. The business is still going now, 34 years later, run by her son. My father-in-law did make Bobby send us some things back to California where we were. She sent things like the bottom to a fondue pot, box of Tupperware lids that didn't match up to anything. Anyway, here's my petty revenge. 34 years later, the 76-year-old sister-in-law has had a stroke. Her children will not help her at all in her large, beautiful house on 13 acres. She asked my daughter to come down, a hundred miles away, to help her clean house and clean out horse stalls. My daughter was deciding if she'd do that. I helped convince her not to. Do you think I was being naughty there? Uh, considering the historical decision making of this sister-in-law, I would just say that's sticking true to the behavior. I mean, this is just what's accepted in this family, right? Stealing from each other and not helping each other out, apparently. Especially during a time of need. Remember, OP said their husband had just passed away. 
they went and stole everything from them. This next story is, won't pay rent? I'll cut off your internet access during movie night. So to make this short, I rented an apartment with two other individuals. One person would pay rent and the other would not. The problem person acted like they owned the place and would do nothing to contribute to the apartment. They would give me tons of attitude and act like everything was my fault, even though I paid for pretty much everything for them. The only reason why I put up with this is because I couldn't get them off the lease due to them being on it. Now for the good part, I about had it one day when they kept on inviting people we didn't know to the apartment and learned from a little birdie that they were inviting five people over to watch a movie. Due to my job making me leave home for long amounts of time, I decided to do the only thing I could do. I went into my router admin panel and disabled the internet access to all the registered devices, changed the password, and gave the new password to the trustworthy roommate. As soon as they realized what I did, their temperament went into temper tantrum territory. They were blowing up my phone, screaming at me and calling me deceitful and all these other words and throwing stuff around the apartment like a toddler. They relocated all my game consoles and any other item including security cameras I'd set up in the living room. So after they did that sort of thing, every other interaction I had with them compounded into this recent interaction and I flat out made it so we all got evicted. Somehow this eviction wasn't put on my record and this happened 4 months ago and they're still living in their car. Sweet, sweet revenge. For anybody curious, they were 21 at the time, going on 5 years old. Well, I guess OP found the one true way to get them off of that lease. Get everybody off of that lease. I don't know if I would want to go to that drastic of a level, but honestly, if you're that frustrated and you feel like you have no other recourse, maybe the nuclear option is the way to go. This next story is, he called me a witch. I got him banned from the store. When I was about 21 years old, I worked at a Dollar Tree. One day, while I was checking people out of an extremely long line, a guy standing towards the back of the line asked me if I could call someone else to the register. I politely told him that the only other cashier was my manager and she was on her 30 minute break, and that I was sorry it was taking so long but I was the only one available. He then proceeded to make rude side comments about how slow I was going and how a toddler could do my job. The lady I was ringing out had over a hundred dollars in stuff, and how the customers in front of him had so much stuff so they must be poor. I politely asked him to stop with his rude remarks as I found it offensive, and I was sure the other customers did too. He then proceeded to tell me to freak off. When he didn't get a reaction from me, he then proceeded to push the person in front of him out of the way and get into my face, calling me a witch and telling me that he would have me fired from my job. I then asked him to please leave the store because his behavior was inappropriate. He then told me to freak off and called me a witch again while throwing his merchandise in my face. He then stormed out. When my boss came back from her break, I told her what happened and she reviewed the footage and told me he was banned. Fast forward to about 4 hours later, I'm walking through Walmart and I see the same guy that was in line at Dollar Tree, but this time he's with his wife. He gave me an extremely nasty look and flipped me off behind her back. I considered letting it go, but I was so irritated with his behavior that I couldn't. So I proceeded to turn around, walk down the aisle, looking him straight in his face, right in front of his wife say, due to your behavior and harassment of me and my customers today at Dollar Tree, you are now banned. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to call XYZ at Dollar Tree. And then I walked away. I could hear his wife chewing him out in the background, asking him what he had done. The next day I went to work and told my boss what I had done. So when he ended up calling to complain, she confirmed that he was banned and said that if anyone saw him in there again, they would contact the police and show them the video of his harassment and assault. He never came in again. And wherever I ran into him, he'd avoid eye contact. A nice piece of simple petty revenge. So let me ask you guys, is this revenge? Or is this just the right thing to do? Especially telling him that in front of his wife. This next story is how to deal with entitled roommates. The story started back in January of 2022. I was dating a friend and we were looking at apartments to live together. We found one, but he brought up an important issue. Since my job takes me out of state across America for a month at a time, he wanted to let his childhood friend move in with us so he wouldn't be lonely. 
It was a two bedroom apartment after all, so I agreed. I thought since he knew her, she would have been a-okay to live with us. I mean, I won't be there most of the time and I trusted him. I even knew her personally and she had a good job and was overall a sane person. That all changed when she moved in with us. Behavioral, she would act like a mother, basically scolding us if the dishes weren't done, which was a cycled responsibility and it was always her turn to do them when she whined. She wouldn't respect house rules like not wearing shoes on the carpet or asking us before inviting strangers over. She would act like she knew everything, and if I brought up a topic of something I was interested in, she seemed to brush it off with, okay. Verbally abuse my ex when he would do little mess ups like spill garbage or play video games after a long work day. She would belittle him and make him feel like a fat pig, which he had sensitivities about. She would attack me personally when I set rules. An example being is that I wanted my own food in the common area fridge, and she threw a fit at me saying, you make all the money but you won't share food? I don't think it's a good idea to split food like that, we need it. The responsibilities? Never would clean, do dishes, etc. Quit her $21 an hour job because it was too hard and started working at the mall. This was her putting in little effort instead of paying rent. And when I'd ask her for this month's rent, she would blame the economy or her made up disability which was not medically verified. Any other thing you could possibly think of, she wouldn't do it and she would make my ex do it. Really important, she would invite random people over that we didn't know and this ended up in an SA case with my ex. Someone came over and abused him and it was the problem roommate's fault. Some stuff ended up missing and she continued to invite random people over without permission even after what happened to my ex. After that happened, I was done dealing with a child. She sucked the life out of me and made me scared for my ex's life and mine. So I enacted a revenge plot. I tried evicting her, but she refused to sign the release form. I talked to many different lawyers and they said they couldn't do anything and the civil judge would laugh at me and make me pay a fine. So I said, screw it. I cut off her internet access since she didn't pay for it and that caused her to almost damage my property and overall touch it without permission while screaming at me over the phone and calling me dangerous. That was step one, making her miserable. Step two was relatively simple. In November, we got our second strike because this woman kept heavy walking and we would always tell her to walk lighter and she would deflect any responsibility and blame the lady downstairs. So I hatched a plan. I would go downstairs and talk to the lady making the complaints. I mean, if we got one more complaint, we got evicted. So I went downstairs, talked to the lovely lady and told her everything. We decided to make a plan regarding her making a falsified noise complaint and that was that. The next day she made the complaint and within 24 hours we had an eviction notice. To see that paper was bittersweet. I worked so hard to get my first ever apartment and she ruined it. But I knew this was my freedom. I knew that after this eviction, our awful roommate would never get back onto her feet due to her reliance on others. She had to move into her 2001 Jetta that had a bad heater, and last I heard from her, she's still in her Jetta. For some reason, living with her new boyfriend in the car? I don't understand it, but I wouldn't be surprised. Just imagine being such a bad roommate that you resort to intentionally getting evicted just because they couldn't bother to even deal with you anymore. Our next story is, give me diarrhea, roll in it. This happened when I was six, I'm a guy. I have an uncle Dave who's an all around jerk. He'd bully my mom and when she fought back, he started going after those who couldn't fight back. His favorite was me because I was a crybaby. One day he gave a food and I stupidly ate it. I got diarrhea and my mom went ape on him, but couldn't do any more as she had to look after me. I was having those thick porridge-like stools and my mom had to buy more medicine for me, so I had cousins look after me. The oldest, Michael, had a good idea. Poo on Dale's belongings. That was at night, so we all went to his house, which was a nice two-bedroom place right next to us. Don't know how Michael got the keys, but I pooed on his bed, favorite chair, and toilet cover. The masterpiece was on his front porch, right on his welcome mat. I let it go and it flowed like stunk butter. When we finished, we went home and they cleaned me up and we watched TV. About 4 in the morning we hear screaming and cussing 
We go see what it was, and it's Dale rolling around in my poo on his porch. He was also drunk. His mother, my grandma, yelling at him, and all the spectators were jeering at Dale. That wasn't the last time I pooed on his porch. To this day, Dale still insists it wasn't him, but everyone knows him as the drunk pooer. I'm just wondering why that wasn't the last time OP did that on his porch. Did OP have another incident and they decided, it seems like that revenge was so successful, might as well make a part two, right? Why not turn it into a trilogy? But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.